welcome Arlene Taylor to the stage. You're very gracious, but I have to tell you, I don't change anybody's life. <laughs> the only way a brain changes is when it changes itself. Having said that, knowledge is power. So if you have some idea of how your brain works uh, better than you did a few months or years ago, your brain will get really excited. It knows how it works best. It's just been waiting for us to get it. And once we get it, it gets so happy that it just helps us be very successful. So I've had lots of questions about the new venture that Impact's world is embarked upon in terms of helping people with their hormone imbalances. So I thought tonight we'd talk a little bit about the importance of balance and then a little bit about the power of stress hormones because we've got some kind of interesting information out about that. First of all, we will start with brain benders <laughs> because these are age-proofing for your brain. And my goal is to live to be at least 120 with good mental, emotional, physical, spiritual function. And to do that, the research is that we need about 30 minutes of challenging brain exercises every day. You can go to my website, click on brain aerobic exercises, and probably have enough there to keep you busy free for months. The problem is that we only know our own brain. That's the one we've lived with ever since we were born. It's the only one we know. And because it's the only one we know, we sometimes assume that other brains are like ours. And when they do behaviors or come up with answers or make comments that we wouldn't make, what's the tendency? What do we tend to think? Something's wrong with their brain. Something's wrong with them. Because mine wouldn't have said that. Well, there's probably nothing wrong with either brain. But it is different. And as the guy in the elevator said, I think it'd be kind of boring if we were all the same. It's the differences that add the spice to life. All right, hormones. You are alive because of your hormones. If you didn't have them, you would not be alive. So number one takeaway is they're powerful and you have to have them to live. They're, think of them just as chemical messengers. Instead, you know, when my dad was young, before I was born, I'm told that he, he delivered telegrams in Vancouver, British Columbia, on his bicycle. Hmm. They've got some weather up there sometimes, so I don't know how that would be. So think of these chemical messengers going throughout your body from house to house, from town to town, from state to state, however you want to picture it, that are sending messages regularly to those different parts of the brain and body. They often are released directly into the bloodstream, drip by little drip, and therefore affect the entire body wherever the blood goes. Some of them wear two hats, which is also interesting. Some function uh, as a hormone and as a neurotransmitter. So the ones that function as a hormone and a neurotransmitter clearly impact the brain in ways that Hormones don't sometimes when they're just a hormone. The norepinephrine, for example, it's produced by the adrenal gland and has everything to do with your ability to manage stressors, to resist stress appropriately. So if that particular hormone and neurotransmitter is insufficient for the amount of stress that you are dealing with, then you can get some pretty horrific consequences to your adrenal glands, to your brain, and so on. They're really powerful. And when we talk about the roar of the tiger, 
they're so powerful that they can actually result in a person's death. So you can't live without them, but they're also so powerful that they can contribute to a person's death. This is what's key to understand about this piece. They're only put out in very small amounts in the body. They dribble out bit by bit. You know, a drop here, and then after a while another drop, and then another drop. So sometimes people think, oh, I've got a, and males often think this, I've got, a, I've got low testosterone, and I don't have a lot of energy, and I don't feel really good. Well, just give me some testosterone pills. When you take a hormone by mouth, you're getting a bolus of the hormone. And think of it as a tsunami that's slamming into your body. They were never designed to be given as, as a bolus. And research is pointing more and more to the fact that hormone replacement is best done through dermal creams that dribble it into the body, if you will, absorb through the skin that mimics the way the body actually puts it out. No, no bolus. Some effects last not very long. Adrenaline is an example of that. You get, you know, pump adrenaline and you get physiological changes and feel very different for a while. And sometimes it's just a few minutes, sometimes it's a few hours. But unless something else triggers the adrenaline, it's going to go back to what we call homeostasis. And then you've got uh, testosterone. The effects of testosterone can last for months, which means that if you have low testosterone and now you're going to try to rebalance your hormones using dermal cream, it's going to take months for that effect to be seen in the way your body's functioning. And we're, unfortunately, in the culture that wants instant everything. You know, I want it yesterday. Well, you didn't get where you are today in a couple of hours. And it's going to take you a while to get back in balance. Just a couple comments about DHEA. It's produced by the adrenal glands. And if your adrenals fail, then some of the sex hormones are called upon to try to get converted into DHEA. And if they're using those up for DHEA, then you don't have them for something else. Understand that you always give up something to get something, period. Nothing is all 100%. You can never have it all. So you always give up something to get something. And part of being mature, in my brain's opinion, is evaluating when you have two choices. What am I getting? And what am I giving up in order to get this? Am I giving up more than I'm getting? In that case, this might not be a very good choice. If you're getting more than you're giving up, then take a look at that. So it's the most abundant hormone in the body. It regulates the upper level of blood sugar. Cortisol regulates the lower level of blood sugar. So you see that, in a sense, DHEA and cortisol, because the DHEA regulates insulin, have opposing effects. One is working on the lower level of blood sugar and one is working on the higher level of blood sugar. And one of the things that you want to avoid for your brain are spikes of blood sugar. And that's where all of the work has come out on the glycemic index. What kinds of foods avoid that spike? Because it can be really harmful to the brain to keep getting these spikes and then having it fall. So if DHEA is too low, for example, and it regulates insulin, you may have trouble with your upper level of blood sugar. On the other hand, if 
there's a problem with cortisol, then you might have trouble with the lower level of blood sugar. So everything is tied together and linked together in the body. And that's the reason that if you find that some one or two hormones are low, you have to be really careful about how you rebalance that or you'll get them out of balance just another way. And that's going to be unhelpful. So cortisol, body survival coordinator, without it you die, but with too much of it you die eventually anyway, because it, uh, it can cause all kinds of problems. So it's, it's got to be in balance for you to be really healthy. And fortunately, in 2014, we're just now starting to get a handle, if you will, on not only the importance of hormones, but the importance of keeping them balanced in order to extend our lives and help us be healthier while we're alive. So it regulates, as I mentioned, the lower levels of blood sugar, and it provides this energy that allows you to live and produce and take action and so on. It requires a minimum of four months, minimum, before cortisol, if there's a real imbalance here, is going to even start coming back into balance. You know, blood, red blood cells replace themselves about every 120 days. And so part of the benefits that people see from hormone replacement is not with the existing cells. Those have already been created. That's a done deal. It's as the cells reproduce themselves and the body environment is healthier, then the cells that are being reproduced are healthier. And that's going to help a person's health. So this is not a fast fix. This is a, a long-term, ongoing way of rebalancing your hormones. Hopefully, you're bringing your lifestyle into balance so that you don't continually keep them out of balance. But it is not a fast fix, and that's sometimes hard for people to swallow in this era of, you know, I ought to be able to just wiggle my nose a little bit and get this puppy fixed. <laughs> Some real new research on cortisol, depression, and teenagers. So I, I brought a couple of these studies for you. This was done at the University of Cambridge in England. They analyzed cortisol levels in saliva samples with teenage girls and teenage boys. In girls, raised cortisol levels along with some depressive symptoms, you know, they just weren't really enthusiastic about life, were linked with about four times higher risk of clinical depression than their peers. So now you have a teenager who's got some mild depression and, and the cortisol gets too high. You know, too much stress, not able to manage it. And down the line a few years, that girl will have four times higher risk of developing a real clinical depression. There's such a correlation between cortisol and that. Now in boys, Raised cortisol levels, along with some depressive symptoms, were linked with 14 times higher risk of clinical depression than their peers. So you see a teenage boy who's under stress, maybe his brain doesn't match what society expects for a male, maybe the parents are arguing, maybe they've just divorced. Divorce is much harder on, on boys than girls. Uh, different things impact girls and boys differently. You see a, a teenage boy and he's got some symptoms of depression and is under stress, better take a look at that. 14 times higher risk of clinical depression is way more than the way it affects girls. I have a question. What exactly is the definition of clinical depression? Is it just a set of questions, a set of... Well, the clinical depression is an actual medical diagnosis. Right, right, I realize. And it really involves the brain being so either low on serotonin or high on cortisol and any number of other things that the person cannot seem to easily pull themselves out of it. You know, there's situational depression, which all of us experience. 
you know, something that we didn't want to have happen happened. And you know, we may actually feel sad for a few days, but most people, if their cortisol is not too high and they weren't already depressed to start with, you know, they can grieve that and recover from that and move on. In a clinical depression, the person finds that almost impossible to do on their own. So they often have to be hospitalized, medicated, have their hormones looked at, and so on and so forth. So it's very serious because people... Oh, when I read that expression, I've always seen that, okay, that's serious. It, it's but very I, I was just serious. Wondering how they put you in that category. You know, it, that. it will depend on your cluster of collection of symptoms. Yeah. And you know, when I first started nursing school in the late 1800s, <laughs> and I did my clinical affiliation for psychiatry at a huge mental, locked mental health facility down in Southern California. People with severe, it was called intractable clinical depression, meaning the person can't change it on their own. They would actually put them in, uh, you know, insulin shock if you will, to see if that would re-regulate the hormones. They never do that anymore. But they still do electric shock for certain categories of, of clinical depression. And it can work. And it is the only thing that does work. You know, I saw a movie, they call that Edison's Medicine. Edison's <laughs> Medicine. <laughs> I'm not talking about sticking your finger in the lot, <laughs> a wall socket. Okay. Now, for teenage boys, low cortisol levels, you know, their adrenals are already whacked because their life's been so stressful. That could be one reason. Low cortisol levels were associated with early onset of aggression and persistence of that aggression. You know, things aren't working for them and they're very aggressive in their communication with others in their interactions with others and three times the number of aggressive symptoms University of Georgia so it looks like from these beginning studies that cortisol imbalance is really not very good for anybody but when you're talking about teenagers it's worse for boys than it is for girls so we do need to take a look at that The brain works best in balance, the body works best in balance, period. Hormones play a huge role in keeping these substances and brain and body function in balance. Huge role. They're constantly monitoring how much thyroid is getting put out, how much cortisol is coming out, where's the DHEA, where's the testosterone. You know, what are we talking about in terms of estrogen, progesterone, um, estradiol? You know, the body is automatically monitoring those and usually keeping them in a fair amount of ba balance unless things are going on in life that just whack those. Or the person has managed, tries to, has tried to manage stress for so long that the adrenals can't even put out enough to keep it in balance or something happens to the sex hormones and you know put out too much too little so on and so forth and you need balance levels and when they get out of balance it's downright ugly and depending how badly out of balance it is it can be terrible person can get so clinically depressed for example that they kill themselves and really, it was a hormonal imbalance. The, the thing that's hard for people to understand, sometimes it's hard even for us to understand in the medical field, is that when hormones get out of balance, people get symptoms. But they can be different in, every, in each body because every body is different. And therefore, a little imbalance of this in one body isn't terrible, but in that body, it just, everything goes to hell in a handbasket, as the saying goes. And some people don't even know their hormones are out of balance. 
they think that this life is hard and then you die. And this is what it feels like when you're a grown up. You know, too bad I couldn't have stayed a kid. And their lives could be so much better, but they have no idea that life really is not this hard. I mean, life, you have to work at it and you have to take care of yourself and so on and so forth, but life's really not that hard. Unless everything's out of whack. And it, you know, to me, I compare it with you get a new piece of software for your computer, and I'm not particularly software literate. You know, I can find my way around the computer pretty much, but you know, remember, we didn't even have television when I was born. So I get this new piece of software, and I think I know what to do, and I push this click on this button, and all of a sudden, 10 things change on my computer. And now I'm trying to send email, and I can't send email. And now I'm trying to print, and I can't print. So I go back to the software, and I uncheck that, and I check something else. Oh, good, I can print. But now I can't even get on the internet. <laughs> you know, everything's got to be in balance for that computer to work right, and the same thing happens in the body, except it's even more serious. Because if the, if the balance is, if it's out of balance, then it can suppress the immune system and other body organs, and you just don't even think right. Now, some people, and if this is a bell curve, some of you in this room, have been stressed and your hormones were probably out of whack before you came out the chute. And therefore, your entire life, your hormones have been out of balance and you think this is what living is. And it can be really difficult for people when they think this is how they should feel and now they start, for example, taking some hormonal cream replacements and um, they don't feel any different for three, four, five, six, ten months, and they go, well, this isn't working. And then they stop, and suddenly they realize that they're feeling worse than they were when they were taking the creams, but they didn't realize that they actually were feeling better because it happens drip by drip by drip by drip. And sometimes you don't realize that, you know, I was feeling a little better. I just didn't know it. So when a pregnant woman is under stress, well, every pregnant woman is under stress. <laughs> <in my opinion. clears throat> Let's put it this way. When a woman is pregnant and she is experiencing undesirable levels of stress, because you need a certain amount just to be alive, especially if she perceives a hostile environment, you know, and I especially think of teenage girls, for example, who get pregnant and the family really uh, does not think this is wonderful and they're afraid of what everyone else is going to think and so they send her across the country to Iowa or Montana or something and she spends the rest of her pregnancy in a home for unwed mothers and then gives up the child. Oh my, that's stressful. The fetus experiences an increased susceptibility to stress and to sex hormones and to any toxins that are in the mother's body because of what she's experiencing. So for a female fetus, a stressful pregnancy can actually result in the child developing a more reactive brain and nervous system which can increase her reactivity to stress over an entire lifetime. So what was your pregnancy like if you're female? I think I had a pretty stressful pregnancy because I had colic for the first six weeks after I came out the chute. And then I found out years later that my mother really didn't want to have a child. She'd been left in an orphanage and thinking about children, this was not a good experience for her. So I think I've probably spent my whole life with a more reactive brain and nervous system. But once you figure that out, you develop good stress management techniques, you still might have a more reactive nervous system, but you know how to deal with it. But it's critical for people like me to keep my hormones in balance. So what would be the cause of a stressful pregnancy? Well, inadequate nutrition. We often see people who 
are in war zones or extreme poverty and they don't have adequate nutrition. Certainly unwed pregnancy, we've already mentioned that. Uh, rejected for being different, and this is huge. Some women are rejected for being different because it's an unwed pregnancy, but sometimes people are rejected just because their own innate brain function is slightly different than society expects for that male or that female. Any type of fear situations, and that can be in war, or it can be any kind of abuse at home, or you you're, don't even have a home, you're homeless, or you've got some drug and substance abuse. So anybody who falls into that category probably begins life, especially if you're female, with hormones that are already out of balance. So so they don't know the difference. They've never had a body with hormones in balance. They've always been out of balance. So these kind of people may actually require higher levels of stress just to get enough cortisol released because their life has been so different. So they can be going through life functioning with not enough cortisol or creating environments, situations, that are stressful that will give them some more cortisol. For example, you have a child who never, ever starts doing anything until 30 minutes after it was already due. You know, they're being driven to school and um, trying to get their last little bit of homework done, or they don't even start getting ready for school until, you know, everybody's standing there going, we should have left five minutes ago. These are the type of children that may be creating those time uh, challenges simply to get more cortisol released because you have to have a certain level just to function in life. So females already have twice the risk for stress-related illnesses compared to males. And if you are the product of a stressful pregnancy, that can be a problem. So as I mentioned, some of these individuals may create chaos. They may embrace a victim position, poor me, all in order to try to trigger cortisol. So it, this is way more complicated than we have thought in the past. Sometimes people take on way more work than one person can do, way more, because it's the stress of having too much to do that gives them enough cortisol. Problem is, people get used to you doing that. And now, your hormones are getting more imbalanced and you realize that's way more than one person can do. So you go to your boss and say, you know, I can do this and this and this, or this and this and this, what do you want me not to do? And the boss who's used to them being over-functioning to put out cortisol goes, oh, what do you mean you can do this, this and this, but not this, this and this? You've been doing it load these 20 years, so that can be a real problem. Any factor that causes a sudden large amount of stress can trigger an imbalance or ongoing chronic stress. And so living an unbalanced lifestyle is ongoing chronic stress. And so you, even if you were born with reasonably good hormonal balances, you can put yourself out of balance. So remember, this is the bottom line. Without stress hormones, you die. But with too much or too little, you die too. I mean, we're all going to die, but you die sooner than you probably would have, and that is not one of my goals. So a simple trauma can impact hormonal balance within 4 to 24 months. Sometimes it doesn't show up right away. Let's say somebody has a, a motorcycle accident. Usually that's going to be a male, unless it was the girl riding on the back of his bike uh, without a helmet on. And so they crash, and she ends up in the hospital for several weeks. Uh, within 4 to 24 months, her hormonal balance can be out of whack. It doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't resolve itself quickly. So remember that. Oh, and, and this is what's interesting. Um, 
the effects of a traumatic fall, that's the reason that medical professionals keep telling people, if you're over 50 at any time of life, but if you're over 50, be really careful about avoiding falls, because if you fall, four months later, about, many people start showing symptoms of dementia. Took a few months, but it was just that fall that triggered it. So when, the, when cortisol is high, too high, immune system's negatively impacted. <coughs> when it's too low, your body cannot mount an appropriate response to stress. When you, if you have done the saliva testing and get your hormonal reports, you know, sometimes people will say, well, you know, my cortisol and DHEA are within range. <coughs> And then I'll look at the report and I'll go, well, yeah, they're in range, but, you know, they're barely above the bottom edge. That's not imbalance. I mean, that's, that's imbalance. So when both cortisol and DHEA are at that low range, and heaven forbid they're in a minus, which sometimes happens, but it's all good. You know, knowledge is power. You can do something if you get the knowledge. When they're both low, we consider the body is in a state of what we call maladaptation, which is another word for hormonal imbalance. And just because of these two being low, lots of other hormones, enzymes, processes are going to also get out of balance. I mentioned this earlier that when you take hormones orally, that floods the body with that hormone. But it puts everything else out of balance. Again, it just may be in a different type of imbalance. So it doesn't really matter which side of the highway you, you fall off of. You fell off the highway, one side or the other. And because it floods the body, and the brain, I think of it as a, a tsunami, a hormonal tsunami, it can trigger the body to shut down its own production of those hormones because, you know, the body goes, whoo, we got lots of testosterone here. We don't need to produce anymore. So the body stops producing the hormones because of this overload. And now as it wanes, because you got your bolus, but it doesn't maintain a smooth level, now you go to further imbalance because you've shut down your own body's production. Topical mimics the body's drip by drip by drip by drip release of those hormones. And sometimes you'll have a, one set of hormones in a, in a morning cream and a different set in the evening cream. And depending how badly your system's out of whack, you might have some in both. So it's very individualized. Usually takes a minimum of 120 days before any improvement is noted because of the creation of new cells and so on. How many months is 120 days? Four. Good job. <laughs> okay, so somebody does hormone replacement for a month and go, I don't know a whole lot of difference, I'm stopping this stuff. You know, I'm not going to pay to have this. Well, you know, you always give up something to get something. It didn't take you a month to get where you are today. It will take you more than a month to get balanced. So it depends what you want to give up to get. And the problem is that if you've been stressed since childhood, you really may think this is how you're supposed to feel and not realize that it can get a whole lot better. Some people rebalance in somewhere between 4 and 12 months. And then I always recommend take a yearly saliva test to see where your numbers are. Given that you're working on a balanced lifestyle as well as the hormone rebalancing, some people then go on just a maintenance cream, depending what it is they need. People have been on this program for 15 years and are feeling, they say, really good. I don't know, because 
only they can tell you how they're feeling. But they believe that they're reversing some of the symptoms of aging and certainly slowing it down. Now let's talk, uh, finish up with the roar of a tiger because I think this is just absolutely fascinating information. So we're going to talk about adult hearing. I'm sure you know the term Hertz, right? HZ. I don't know much about Hertz, but it appears that the normal higher limit of the adult ear is about 20,000. It's higher than that with babies and little children. That's why I've got to be so careful around them with really loud noises. All of us should be careful, but certainly babies. But it's about 20,000 hertz. The bottom limit is 20 hertz. So now you've got a low blood sugar and a high blood sugar. Now you've got you know, the bottom of the hearing range and the top of the hearing range. Infrasounds, do you know that name? Do you know that word? Infrasounds, if you don't, you do now. This is stimulate your brain, learn a new word. Infrasounds are low frequency sounds that are lower than the normal limit of human hearing. So their cycles per second are lower than 20 hertz. Some sounds have, you can hear them within the 20 to 20,000 range and you also can feel something because some of part of the sound is below the 20 hertz. Okay, have I said this in a way that makes sense? All right. These infrasounds consist of a very long wave and researchers say that this wave of sound actually can go between particles and molecules rather than just hitting them and bouncing off as many sounds do. So they can actually pass through concrete, buildings, through mountains, through the ground for hundreds of miles, and so on. So for a very loud sound, you may hear part of it with the human ear, but you may sense the part that is the infrasound. Therein lies the problem. So we've got uh, many kinds of inf infrasounds. Some are common to nature, some we as human beings have made. This, I mentioned that babies are really sensitive to loud sounds and that's partly because their hearing is more acute than ours in adulthood and they have what's called the startle reflex. And that's one of the things that pediatricians will check uh, a baby for to see if they have the startle reflex. They'll make a large sound, they'll maybe clap their hands right behind the baby and the baby will startle. Okay, that's, that's what we want. We want that startle protective re reflex. And if the baby has no startle reflex, then the doctor thinks, hmm, Neurologically, there might be something wrong here. So examples of infrasounds are sonic booms. You've all felt that as well as heard that. Uh, earthquakes, landslides, you know, avalanches. There's a lot of infrasound going on there. Uh, war is filled with it. You will, you will sense it with huge waterfalls. A couple years ago I was fortunate enough to go to Africa and go to uh, Victoria Falls. I'd always wanted to see Victoria Falls. You could feel the falls walking along the ground three or four miles before you could see anything but the plume of, you know, the water coming up from the falls. It was, it was amazing. But you, you would think the ground was getting ready to have an earthquake. Uh, you're just sensing the power of the infrasound of that. Those of you who have a cat, who owns a cat? Anybody? Okay. So you can hear the cat purring because usually they purr somewhere between 20 hertz and 50 hertz. So that's above the level of the adult human hearing. But if you put in earplugs 
and your cat is sitting on your lap, you feel the infrasounds of that purr, whether you're hearing anything or not. A lot of animals use infrasounds, and we're just now realizing that that happens. When elephants trumpet, is that spelled right? I have to get my spelling checked. Occasionally I forget to run it through spell check, and you already know spelling is really energy intensive for my brain. <laughs> Elephants trumpet at between 15 and 35 hertz. So, is there an infrasound in the elephant's trumpet? Yes, because what's the bottom level for human hearing? 20, and this goes below that. So when an elephant trumpets, you're going to hear, but your body is going to sense that infrasound. Uh, 117 decibels is pretty loud. It, um, you wouldn't want to be too close to that. Somebody said the other day that that's like 25 lawnmowers being started at the same time, right where you are. That's pretty deafening. Now, in the air, these, the sounds travel up to about six miles. But the infrasounds can go through the ground, solid ground, for hundreds of miles and be picked up by other herds of elephants standing on the ground. And this is how, one way, they send messages between herds of elephants. Who knew? Recent work by a man in England believes that the way homing pigeons find their way around is navigating by infrasounds, and who knew that? I don't really understand how they do that, but that's what he says. So the roar of a tiger. Any of you been to the zoo and gone to the cat house and stood there about the time for feeding and listened to them roar? Oh, it's one of my very favorite things to do. It's just so powerful. I just stand there and am in awe. Well, the roar of a tiger contains both audible sounds and infrasounds, and the infrasounds can go 18 hertz and lower. Is that below the lower end of human hearing? Yes. Good. And it can penetrate solid walls, that infrasound part. So when I go to San Francisco Zoo, I used to take the kids there, and we would try to get there by 2 o'clock, because that's when they fed the lions and the tigers. And if we were a little late, now I realize we were feeling the infrasounds of their roaring as we were walking along the ground. The tigers prey not just hear, does, is more than hearing the sound, it's feeling the infrasound. Usually the last thing is one researcher says that their victim feels or hears. When your body hears, senses an infrasound, apparently the body puts out stress hormones. Because infrasound is designed to tell you there's something very big, very powerful, very dangerous, very whatever happening. And so you sense the infrasounds and out comes the stress hormones. 114 decibels, that's not much quieter than the elephant's 117. And uh, this researcher said that 114 decibels equates to 25 times uh, the, the loudness of a gas lawnmower, which is pretty deafening. Because the infrasounds evidently trigger stress hormones, it can actually temporarily paralyze its victim. It's just like the deer in the headlights look. And that allows, it helps the tiger catch it. And in some um, I was going to say experiments, but that's not really it. People out in the wild recording and watching from, you know, blinds up in the tree, hopefully protected somewhere. Sometimes the creature dies of fright before the, the tiger can even kill it. There's been such a bolus of stress hormones that it just flops over dead. And 
So that's no big deal now for the tiger to have dinner. Humans can sense these infrasounds, feel the roar of a tiger, just like the tiger's prey, even if you're not out in the wild. Interesting studies about trainers who've worked with tigers for years know about infrasounds, and all of a sudden, unexpectedly, the tiger will let go of a roar, and the trainer is momentarily paralyzed. And sometimes that can be unfortunate. So we react to sounds that we can hear that go between the 20 and 20,000 decibel level, but we also react to infrasounds. And we need to know that, be aware of it. I carry earplugs with me all the time. If I go into an area where there's lots of loud sounds, I'll just pop in my earplugs. I can still hear through them, but it gets the decibel level down just a little bit. So pouring out the stress hormones again is different for different individuals. Let's say that some huge really loud infrasound comes and your hormones are really out of balance and your body calls for stress hormones and your adrenal glands are whacked and there's none to put out. It's going to make it difficult for you to deal with that stress. On the other hand, you put out too many. Uh, people have had strokes and in rare cases died just like the tiger's victim, because the hormones are that powerful. All right, let's finish up with this. The actions you take and the behaviors you exhibit today impact your immune system somewhere between four and 24 months. So some people, as I said, have had this impacted their entire life and they don't know any other way to live and they don't realize how really in bad shape they are and how good they could feel. So sometimes they'll start on dermal creams but nothing seems to happen and so they'll think, oh well, you know, the instant coffee didn't happen fa as fast as I wanted it to do so this isn't working for me. Remember that even if you weren't born stressed, you, many of us have experienced long-term stress. And four to 24 months later, our hormones are really out of whack. It's really critical to learn good stress management techniques so that when bad things happen to good people, we have some strategies for dealing with them. But it's also important to understand that if you, are, if you have embarked on a program to get these balanced, you know, we're looking at four to 24 months just to start getting them balanced. And then we need to talk about how we're going to maintain that the rest of our lives. So this is not a quick fix. I tell people, if you plan to be alive, you know, in five years, Start working on it now. It's very much like a, a woman I met about the time I was deciding to work on a doctorate. She said, I want to get a doctorate too. I said, good, why don't we do it together? We can study together. Well, she moved to another city and I lost track of her. Ten years later, I met her again and she said, oh, last time we talked, we were going to get our PhDs. Did, did you get yours? I said, yes, I did. Did you get yours? Uh, no, I didn't. I said, really, what happened? Uh, well, she said it just seemed like it was going to be a lot of work, and it was going to be three or four or five years before I could be done, and so I just never started. I have no agenda for anybody to get a PhD, except for Anita. <laughs> The bottom line is, if your hormones are out of balance, start now, if you plan to be alive, because in two or three or four or five years, you may be amazed to be that much older and feeling that much more better than you are right now. Thank you for doing this, Greg. 
it's really wonderful that we do have this opportunity up here to do this because there's only a few places in the nation that are doing this and they're not always willing to have it done off site so i don't know what greg had to do to twist Dr. Borkin's arm. Don't tell me what you did. I'm just glad you did. Yes. Thank you.